uh, that's okay, don't, don't worry. What are the challenges uh, posed by the digital age, in particular, the growth of AI? Um, and what are the opportunities that we as multimodal researchers have? What can and should we do? I don't have a definite answer, but I'm going to tell you what, you know, we're doing at the University of Liverpool. Um, this is significant questions. We are in a semiotic age, you know, an age of information and so forth, but it's very rarely called a semiotic age, you know, so researchers that are involved in semiotics, you know, in other words, meaning through language, images, videos and so forth. Um, you know, you don't hear much about the semiotics of it all. We hear a lot about information, digital age, computer age, new media age, etc. They're the terms that are, about, you know, that are often discussed. Okay, so we are in a different age. We know this, um, and it's because computers, um, you know, are designed as semiotic machines, input, processing, output. Um, and that's basically changed, I think, the whole kind of, um, what's changed day-to-day -day life, it's changed the way we do everything, basically. Uh, you can't really do much without being online, which, of course, creates all sorts of inequalities and so forth. But I won't talk about that today. Really what I want to focus on is what are the implications of digital media technology and AI for the future direct directions of the work we do? Um, and what I'll do is I'll use a project on context-based informa multimodal information fusion as an example, and show a platform that we've developed in order to um, analyze, you know, multimodal, you know, text at scale and visualize the results. Okay, um, some of you may have seen this before. I mean, I start off with this because I think it sets the scene. Um, if you have a cartoon character like that, everywhere I go, they know it's me. That that was expected. Um, that's what the whole point of was having something that was recognizable. Um, as we know from different sorts of collections and different sorts of, you know, media that passes around. But, of course, everywhere I go, they know it's me. It's on the street now. It's us. Um, and everywhere I go, metaphorically, meaning everywhere I go on the internet as I'm typing and, you know, searching the web and doing all sorts of things, communicating, using Gmail, everything, everywhere you go online, um, they do know that it is you, <laughs> of course, and they're collecting data about every single thing that you're doing. Okay, so, you know, to start the context off straight away, the current wave of AI developments, uh, it is focused on massive data harvesting, automation and surveillance, and it is for profit making purposes. If you look at the list of the top 10 companies in the world in terms of, you know, value or, you know, in terms of what they're worth, um, they're technology based companies, you know, the Googles, the uh, Microsoft, the Apples and so forth. And it is for profit making purposes. And as Ace Moglu and Johnson said last year, it does divert energy and research from other socially more, you know, beneficial directions for general purpose digital technologies. Um, and it is determined by the elites, the ones that are controlling, you know, basically the sort of technology that's developed. And what's really interesting is a lot of the AI institutes that are set up are partnerships with industry. And so they're still, you know, along that meeting the aims of industry um, sort of objectives rather than if you want for public goods, so to speak. How did this situation arise? Um, open AI just go, oh, it's technological development. And so it's a natural kind of outcome of the way things are going. But of course, it's not natural at all. It's all made by choice. So, you know, AI says, okay, this is the explanation of how we got to the large language models. We had tr transistors, we had computers, we had the internet, we had semiconductors, we had programming languages, and now we've got AI, a simple progression. All of us who are multimodal researchers and in the humanities and social sciences know that it's a more complex context than that. Um, it's much more complex, of course, because, as Halliday said, you know, now nearly 20 years ago, um, what we've got is semiosis. And if you think about computers as creating signs, which, of course, they do, um, it's not as simple as, you know, the semiotic systems are the most complex. And behind that, you've got social systems, biological systems and physical systems, I mean, in terms of order of simplicity. So if we're looking at the development of technology, it's not simply that it happened, it's embedded within social systems and biological systems, in other words, humans. And of course, there's a the physical hardware behind it, which is what, you know, um, OpenAI are explaining. It's just physical hardware. Of course, it's not that. It's embedded with a whole range of social structures, uh, regulations and so forth. And that's how come we've got to the situation we've got at the moment. 
Okay, so technology's traditionally been developed to control the material world, um, but now really, um, and this is where we come in, it's concerned with gathering and analysing information to control basically and to modify human behaviour. The technologists such as, you know, Elon Musk, and this is Bill Gates back in 2008, said, you know, he ties it with sort of um, solutions to global problems, you know, the challenges to design a system where market incentives, including profits and recognition, drive the change with the goal of improving the lives of those who don't fully benefit from market forces. And Gates called this ages ago, creative capitalism. And this is how it's touted, it's solutions to global problems, it's progress, it's moving forward. Um, but underneath all of that, of course, we've got the digital ecosystem as it stands at the moment. And as I talked about before, about harvesting information and data about people in order to modify behavior for profit making purposes. So although the algorithms use scientific forms of representation and big data, basically to learn patterns, um, it, it's not designed to cover the whole range of human experience but nonetheless, the wide ranging impact um, and the processing of data is well recognised. And it's got to do with the sheer volume of data that we've got and the data that they collect from different contexts and piece that together in a way that we were always talked about, you know, meaning is contextual. But in a sense, when you harvest data from, from someone across a whole range of platforms, you build up quite an interesting picture of context um, and patterns of behaviour. And human behaviour is pattern the way we speak, what we tend to do, day-to-day -day habits and so forth, which if you've got enough of it and you keep running the algorithms, they, you get pretty accurate in terms of um, prediction and so forth. For example, ChatGPT4, it's a large multimodal model, as we know, uh, processing image and text inputs and producing text outputs. And of course, you know, with um, DALI, we've got DALI3 now, put a linguistic description in, you get a visual image which corresponds to it. There's so much money being poured into this um, because of the range of applications, dialogue systems, text summarization, mach machine translation. And so there's a lot of money gone into all of this. Um, and really what OpenAI says is one of the main goals is to improve the ability to understand and generate natural language text, particularly in complex and nuanced scenarios. So this is a context we're operating in. Um, this is where we're at. And, you know, as I said, the image generator model as well. So, although AI at the moment is unlikely to reach human levels of intelligence, at this stage at least, um, because of all the knowledge that humans bring to any particular context, um, it, and, you know, we bring together a lot of knowledge about causal relationships, you know, build up over, you know, our experience of the world, um, but basically what I think is interesting for us is what Ace Moglu sort of explained is the shortcomings of the current approach to AI is they don't actually have a model. They don't have a theory of the phenomenal being model, which is what really what we have in quite complex theories about semiosis, about um, how language and images make meaning, how they combine, how it interrelates with the context and so forth, you know, using going back to Halliday's model of semiosis is, you know, some make, mean, making meaning through science has got a social, you know, systems behind that, biological systems, meaning our, you know, our sensory apparatus and so forth. Um, and of course, there's physical science as well. So we do have a theory. Um, and I guess we haven't actually ever learned how to fully operationalize that theory. Um, but perhaps it's time that we started if we're going to address the issues of big data and big data analysis and what's going on concurrently. So I will say that our research needs to address the new challenges arising from the digital ecosystem and AI. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, although numerous research institutes have been established, these are collaborations between university, industry and government aiming to develop AI in certain directions for the market. So what am I saying? Let's enter the fray. Let's go in there and start using and developing AI techniques to demonstrate social cultural patterns and alternatives, um, alternative choices of the current direction for public good. In other words, show what AI can, does um, 
you know, demonstrate it, we can probably improve it using our models. Um, and that's going to be an interesting development, I think, in the future. But sort of, in a sense, demonstrate what's going on and perhaps change the current direction. Um, and I mean that in terms of universities as well. Okay, I'll sh now talk about what we're doing um, in this sort of direction uh, through the Pandemic Institute. Um, what we had is, have as a project, healthcare communications and information distortion. So we looked at um, all the communications that were going around about COVID in the Merseyside, which is the Liverpool area. And what I'm working with is a team of data scientists and virtual engineer, uh, virtual reality specialists uh, from the Virtual Engineering Centre. Um, and this work has been uh, undertaken in the Digital Media, um, Digital Media and Society Institute, which I'm co-director of, um, along with Simeon Yates. So it's a, it is a, um, it is a multidisciplinary team, comms and media, uh, data science, geographic data science as well, virtual reality and immersive analytics, although we haven't actually got to the immersive analytics part yet, and also in conjunction with the Liverpool City Council. Okay, um, so what we want to do is look at what the government's saying during COVID. We want to look at what the news was reporting during COVID, and what we are also looking at is how people were reacting in social media. And really the aim of this is to look at how the healthcare communications were received and translated by people, um, the types of information distortions that, that carried, you know, that were occurred in text and images and videos, including accidental misinformation um, and deliberate mis disinformation and malinformation, and how these behaviours vary according to contextual factors. So this is the context-based multimodal information fusion. You know, we're looking at it over time, we're looking at in relation to major events during COVID, such as when the vaccinations were released, such as lockdown and different government directions. Now, what we're calling this is context-based multimodal information fusion. Um, some scientists are already like working within this area. What we hope to do is bring the models and theories that we know from our multimodal analysis into this picture as well. I haven't got that far, but what we have done, um, I'll show you now, is set up a infrastructure for bringing in large quantities of um, media communication media text across different platforms, um, analysing them using the existing natural language processing algorithms that are there, image processing and video processing. And the platform is sort of extendable that we can continually update it. Um, and what we needed to do was develop a visualisation um, dashboard in order to look at the results after the text had been brought in, analysed, um, to look at and explore the results. Now, this is the framework. It's, I mean, I'd, you know, it looks complicated and probably you won't be able to read it on your screen. But basically what this framework is showing is we're bringing in government messaging, we're bringing in online news, we're bringing in social media data, which is geotagged, what we do is we pre-process all of that. We process the text, we process the videos by splitting the videos into text and into images through key frame extraction. And we also analyze the images, you know, the photos and everything that accompanies, um, you know, online news and social media text. And then what we do is we bring it in and do the, quanti the sort of quantitative analysis um, of existing algorithms that are out there. For example, the blue ones at the top are all the image processing. So we do text identification. Is that okay? Yes, not a problem. So if you look at the quantitative analysis with the blue part, that's all the image processing, the text identification, which goes into optical character recognition, face detection, emotion detection, celebrity recognition, object recognition, keeping in mind that this is extendable. So as new algorithms for image processing come on board, we can integrate them into the platform. Then we do the um, uh, natural language processing, key phrase, topic modeling, sentiment analysis, named entity recognition. We look at moderation analysis as well, linguistic relation analysis, and then we embed the two, the linguistic and the visual. Um, and on top of that, of course, we do some qualitative stuff, checking that the results are reasonable. And what I'll demonstrate um, very just now, uh, next, is I'll show the interactive web dashboard, which combines the media analysis and you can explore the patterns and so forth uh, from the analysis. What we're doing also is integrating it into a meta Liverpool map. 
uh, meta livable platform. What what the virtual engineering centre did is they've got a, a virtual 3D map of Liverpool, and it's it, and I'll show you that as well. And basically, all the geotag uh, social media analysis, we can pinpoint to different parts of the city and look at different sorts of communities. Uh, what different sorts of communities located in different areas of the city are actually talking about in terms of all their concerns uh, during the pandemic. Okay, so I'll go, um, I hope everyone can follow this and I'm not moving too fast or um, or too slowly uh, for some people. Um, okay, I'll move into the pandemic uh, visualisation dashboard. So I'm doing this, I'll just, uh, I'll do a new share. I'll stop sharing that and I'll move into now um, sharing the screen. This is now sort of live, um, uh, live meaning, um, can you see now the screen here you can? Mm -hmm. um, Live meaning um, this is the internet-based um, visualisation web platform. So what I'm doing is logging into our website mm -hmm. where the information uh, with the dashboard is located. I'll just move it around my screen a bit because the images of you all is um, interacting. I've just got to – actually, what I'll do is reduce the screen on my, the size of it so I can see what I'm doing here. Okay, let me just log in. Um, Sign in. So signing in uh, through my Gmail account because that was the easiest way to set it up. Whoops. No, I don't want that. I want. Um, let me just go back to the page. That's it. Okay. Can, so everyone should be able to see that screen. Let me just mm -hmm. minimize my screen a bit more so I've got complete kind of control of it. Some of the things, because it's now so small, I can't hide that. Um, what I'd like to do is hide it so I can't see you all. Um, that's okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I'll I'll do my best with this because it's on a smaller screen now than what I, I'd normally do. What what we see here, and this is the home page. Basically, what this shows is all the data sources that we had. So we had five thousand nine hundred and sixty-one government messages. Uh, we had ninety-three thousand news articles, and we had eighteen thousand social media. What we can see from here, if we just go. And if you click here, you can see the different sources of where we got all the information from, uh, all the media connections, the different news um, that we scraped and so forth, and the different media, social media sites. Oh, it's a little bit difficult because I oh, it's out of the way. Let me just, um, so with the social media, we only looked at Twitter, YouTube and Reddit because that's all we could have access to. What I'd like is this screen here, to, if we can, to disappear. Um, I don't know if you can actually do it though. Which one? Uh, the one of, oh, that's it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, now just move that. It. That's fantastic. Or maybe I can just move it as well. Mm -hmm. That would be, oh, good. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. Of course, you could just move it. Thank you. That makes it a lot better for me. That's great. Let me just um, make this bigger as well. It's moved it to down the bottom. I just want to move it a little. Okay. That's better. Mm -hmm. Oh, it pops back up again. But anyway. Okay, so um, what? So um, basically, we can see that for the government messaging, a lot of the sentiment of all the data was fairly neutral, as one would expect. Very negative on the news and very negative on social media. Um, what we also, when we were doing all this analysis, um, is it's temporal, um, although you can't see it on this dashboard. And so, what we were looking at was the COVID timeline of the major events in the UK. I'm talking about not worldwide. So this is specific to sort of the UK. So this is why we're sort of saying context-based information fusion over space over time. Okay, so let's have a look at the overview. Um, what you've got, what you can do is search for the different results according to you know any sort of time frame. You know what we've got here, what I'll display as results from um, the sixth of January right through to the first of the first twenty-three, and you can search for keywords, um, object keywords meaning you know, and I'll demonstrate this in just a minute. Object tags, if you're looking for certain things within the image, certain sorts of sentiment, data source of everything that we've got. Um, you, you can do sort of a moderation search as well and celebrity tags and so forth. So let's have a look at the keyword distributions. I'll just um, have a look at what sort of results we get here. So what we're doing now is we're searching for keywords across all of the data. And we we'll see the keywords unsurprisingly, uh, coronavirus, COVID, lockdown. What we were doing was searching for data about COVID. We had a whole range of keywords. And the keywords we generated, actually, interestingly enough, through ChatGPT, mm -hmm. to see what are the keywords that were across all the communications. 
Um, and then we can see the sentiment um, for these keywords, all the keywords, once again, largely neutral from the government, negative from um, the news and negative from, um, from social media. What we did, which I think is interesting too, is what we did is we did a prompt because what we're interested in is, well, how do these lang large language models work? So what we did is we did a prompt to chat GPT and said, okay, chat GPT, this is all the results, analyze it for us. Mm -hmm. And this is not because we're thinking they're going to give us the correct answer of the analysis of this data, but rather it's a critical look at how chat GPT would interpret something like this. In other words, to identify the sort of strengths and weaknesses within the model. And so what we've done is we've prompted it, okay, make a sense of this data. And what we can do live is now what chat GPT, chat, what GPT is doing um, is it's summarising the data that we can see here. And you get some interesting results from this. So, you know, this is the, 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 the large language model is saying, okay, it's focused on keywords. Um, the news is focused on these keywords. Um, the sentiment is largely negative for news uh, with a significantly high stuff we can sort of see. Um, and then if you go to the social media interpretation, it's also predominantly negative. So it sort of fits with what you've got here. What's interesting is when we go to the possible reasons that they come up with for these results, the government may focus on providing factual information um, and updates leading to a more neutral sentiment. News outlets may emphasise negative aspects to attract attention and highlight the severity of the situation. Social media discussions may be influenced by personal experience, emotions, and opinions leading to a higher negative sentiment. Okay, so that's what they're, you know, kind of generic sort of stuff. But what happens then if we search for a keyword such as, um, say, deaths? And let's see what we get when we update the results about round death as a key word. So we see that death's actually, you know, when death is a key word, it appears in 20, it's 29% distributed, um, coronavirus and so forth, and we can see the differences. But when we come down here, well, the government, when they're reporting about this, is still, is still largely neutral. Mm -hmm. We see now within the news that it's hugely, of course, negative. Um, and, of course, within social media, it's hugely negative, as one would expect when there's reports about deaths and people dying. And when we do the chat GPT, now the, the GPT interpreter, um, what we see is the summary is kind of interesting because they still just do the generic, oh, these, these keywords, these keywords, these keywords. And, but what's interesting is the reasons. The government may aim to provide a neutral tone to provide information without causing panic. Pretty hard to do when you're talking about deaths. Um, and the huge, you know, neutral sentiment towards it. Um, remembering that the government I'm talking about here is the UK government. Um, I'm not, you know, because this is specific to the UK. News outlets may focus on reporting negative aspects to highlight the severity of the situation. Yeah, quite likely when it's deaths. Social media discussions may reflect a mix of personal experiences, opinions and emotions leading to a more varied sentiment. I mean, in actual fact, we're talking about this and you would expect it to be negative. So, you know, the, the large language model misses out hugely on what the implications of these sort of keyword search are. And if we take that a little bit further, we could go and look at Boris, um, Boris Johnson, and I'll update it now, and Boris Johnson is a keyword. Um, I mean, so as you would expect, Boris Johnson, um, if we come down and look at it, when the government was talking about Boris, it was all neutral, probably because it was Boris talking about Boris, although I would expect <laughs> that it's probably positive <laughs> when he talks about himself. <clears throat> but in the news, of course, we get huge negative sentiment and you get even more negative sentiment um, when you've got um, on social media because everyone turned right against it. So let's, that's, that's just sort of a, a keyword distribution thing. But what we can do, and I think this is sort of interesting as well, is what we've got at the top, I'm now on topics over time. So what we've got is a timeline of key events that happened during the pandemic. Prime Minister announces new restrictions um, in England, leading a return to working from home and 10 p.m. curfew for hospitality sector, rapid growth in cases and deaths in the UK. So in other words, that top line is, you know, a list of key events. And what we've got here now over the time 
is the sentiment analysis for government news and social. Now, remembering that we're still searching for Boris Johnson. So what we see is the government is the orange line is flat. It's pretty neutral. What you see is huge shifts and a lot negative in news and, of course, in social media. And what we can also do is look at, like, um, under this search for Boris, is we can look at government topics over time. And if you look at the government topics, it's about COVID, it's about coronavirus, what you'd expect, um, you know, statements, announces and so forth. As soon as you start looking at the news topics over time with the keyword Boris, is you get a little bit deeper into what's actually going here because you get, you know, con configurations of party gate, scandals, lockdowns, um, vaxxers, but, you know, Brexit comes into it, Christmas, what Boris was doing, um, and so forth. And, of course, you know, with social media, it gets into Christmas and the Christmas parties um, and, you know, you get into other things like, schools, care, you know, so the, the shift turns when you're talking about Boris, you know, with these different media platforms, you know, about what was happening with all the parties and so forth, and also about people's concerns about what was going on in social media with children and schools and so forth. Um, what we were mapping that against is the hospital cases over time and also the COVID number of beds. So this is, I mean, it's not, you know, I mean, it is, you know, it's still fairly rudimentary, really. But what we're trying to do is map the key events over time and look at that in relation to other sorts of data sets, such as the number of hospital cases. Okay, so if we keep going with this, um, let's have a look. That was sort of just the overview. What we can start doing is we can start exploring the data. Remembering now, I'm still um, searching for Boris, but what I might be interested in um, as I'm searching for Boris um, is maybe the images that were accompanied at that time. So what I'll do is I'll do now a search for um, Boris with images of him within the data set. And this is where we can really go in and explore and have a look at what these large language model, what, what these NLP models are doing and image processing models are doing. You can, you know, really sort of have a look. And this is where we can start looking at how the text and images are actually combining. So say I pick this one here, what we've got is this, you know, picture of Boris Johnson and it's Starhub. Let me just go back and I'll do the analysis from it. So let me uh, go back. Um, let me just, sorry. I can't see on the screen where to go back. Oh, here it is. Um, so if we if we pick this one here of the, you know, this particular sort of tweet that was going around at the time, what we can show is an analysis of it where you get to see what is being analysed, um, what the confidence levels are, um, what the text analysis is and what the image analysis is. This, of course, is a meme. This is a play on Die Hard, and this is like Boris Johnson Lie Hard. What we see here is then we've got the image analysis where it picks up that it's a clock, it picks up that it's one person, but it doesn't pick up that it's Boris Johnson in the image analysis. But nonetheless, what we'll see with the text analysis is that it actually does, because he's mentioned by name. So this is all the written text, which is, um, you know, by up to character recognition is translated into text and analysed, besieged by an army, a trouble, some facts and so forth. Um, what you can see then, um, that's the text, That's the, and this is the analysis. And you can then see that what it's doing is searching for named um, entity recognition of the key you know, parts of the text itself. So in a way, I mean, this is a meme, and what you'll have is that the text and image don't match. You know, you've got an image of a clock, you've got an image of a person, and then we've got something about, you know, Boris Johnson and Troubled, and you've got the lie heart, although that doesn't get picked up. This may be some way of, you know, when we go in and look at the text image relations, some way of picking up how misinformation actually gets translated, because what we get is images are recontextualized over time, of course. So if we can really look at the text and image relations, we can look at when the same text appears, but with different text, or when the same text appears with a different image, and start looking at the relations uh, between the two. So, you know, that's, you know, so that I guess it's just demonstrating you can go right in and actually check all the analysis um, to see how it's going, you know, to see whether it's accurate, you know, what it's picking up, and also these text image relations. So if I go back to explore, what we, and I'll just, um, this will be all the um, keywords now, what I can, we might be able to want to look at videos. 
and what the video analysis looks like. And so I'll go to YouTube um, and what we'll do is we'll now have a look at the, you know, the, the different videos that were circulating through YouTube about COVID. And once again, you can, you know, you can look at the actual analysis. Um, and what we'll see is that the written text gets, you know, through up to character recognition gets um, transcribed. What we'll see with the video, we talked a long time about how to do this video analysis. And what we decided on was key frames. So what you'll see is that the algorithm automatically picks up key frames due to the, the amount of change that happens between the frames. And what we've got then is whatever the spoken is, you know, the text that goes with it is transcribed and also the text that appears on the video itself um, is also transcribed as well. So what we have here, I've got I'm on mute, but if I played it, there's someone talking and this is what they're saying. Normally this would be a sort of people dream beer and dancing place, you know, we're just going to show you the dining experience. So there's a narrator, there's a, you know, someone speaking here as they're taking us into this sort of restaurant bar. Hello, welcome to, you know, this Schloss, I, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So what we've got is, and what you've got is then uh, the key word, the key in frames are picking up when to, um, picking up key frames in, in relation to what is being said. So the t you get the text and image, what's happening in the video visually match with what's happening in the image, um, yeah, through the linguistic. So we can pick up key phrases and so forth. Um, like that. So that's just sort of a very sort of brief, like, you know, our attempts at trying to integrate this with video analysis as well. Okay, let's move. To, and I'm, I'm just watching the time. I want to leave time for questions. Um, so I'll just move on. That was the explore where you can go into great detail of, you know, what, what the text are you looking at. What we're also looking at relations, um, like between the different entities. So, for example, the named entity categories. I'll just do a search for that. Let me just see. I'll just update it. So this is all the this is all the data once again. Um, this is a really nice visualization um, of all the named entities within the text, um, organizations, people, locations. Um, so we can get a sort of you know a, a comparison. It's just loading. As I say, this is live. So this is like getting the results from our database and bringing it up and showing it. So what we've got, for example, here is this is the result for the government, um, you know, in terms of the named entity, sort of, you know, the organisations, the events that happened and so forth. If you click on, say, and you wanted to have a look in more detail about all the different organisations, you can, um, and you can go back to, you know, the, the Sunburst. But then we can, like, compare to what it was across the news um, and also what it was across social media. And look at say the you know the different organisations here. They were in social media. It was about government. It was about BBC News, which was reporting a lot. Um, the Tory government, of course, the government, BBC, and whatever. If we go back up to what the government was talking about in terms of organisations, they were looking talking about Sage, who was the medical you know um, experts that were called in the government and a whole range of other types of NHS and so forth. So I guess this is once again some sort of you know comparison across the different um, media platforms and the named entity recognitions, and we could do an interpretation of that as well. Um, if we go to the knowledge graphs, this is basically looking at the configurations of what words were associated with other. You know, this is for the government. You know, so you could say look at the UK and then pick you know the government what keywords they were. What the named entities were around different keywords such as infection studies and so forth and compare that you know to the news and to social media as well where what we've got is a whole range of different concerns the big one was about people um, and the big one about uk as well but also of course it was specific to liverpool because we were looking at that and you could do an interpretation of that as well what I like in particular is this one, um, and I think this is getting more towards what we know in terms of our multimodal analysis, and that is like a lot of these um, natural language processing algorithms are built on the word or the word group, as we've just seen. With the SVO, we try to look at subject, verb, object patterns, um, and that comes now a little bit into more configuration of the happenings. So in the government, you see sort of certain sorts of patterns um, you know, about that and reports, studies show this, and Minister Boris Johnson, et cetera. 
when we look at news, you get different sorts of, you know, key agents, you know, about, you know, what they're doing uh, to what. And, of course, when you come down to social media, it's really varied. We, government, councils, groups, you know, and so forth. So, you know, variants and so forth. So, I mean, once again, this is just a way of comparing. And if, you know, we took a, a keyword such as lockdown, we could see actually how that was discussed, um, you know, in terms of what was the subject, you know, what was the verb associated that and directed towards what. And you'll see, you know, with the government, it was about lockdowns, people, um, we, government, so forth. Um, airlines, because they were really concerned about, you know, the commercial aspect of all of this, survey data, et cetera. And then when you move on to news, it was very different. I'm like concerned about parents and what parents were doing. You know, parents drop children. Um, some have created um, a, a time slots. I think that was probably for sharing childcare or something. You and so forth, pupils. Um, and, of course, in social media, it was very diverse with people being worried about a whole range of different concerns. Um, I'll just vary, and I'm going to finish now because, uh, or soon, or within five minutes, because, as I said, I'll move to other questions. What we're trying to do is map that geospatially. Um, and so let me just, um, this is for all the data. Um, what we, we've done is like the, over a timeline is the data that we collected, which is social media data, is geotagged. Um, and of course, that's only a small percentage of the data because a lot of people don't geotag. But what we've got is, you know, you can move, move in and zoom. This is the sentiment analysis um, of the different parts. This is Liverpool itself. This is... Um, the, uh, the Wirral, which is the opposite side of the Mersey River. But what we've got here, um, I just need to, um, let me just, oops, I've got this in the, let me just get this out of the way. Oh, I'll move it up. Sorry, sorry about pulling this around. Everywhere. What we've got is a visualization where you can play it over time. Oops, sorry, a bit rough here. But what we've got is you can see the different social media posts over time. You can animate it and slow it down. And you can show it also um, if you wanted to. To make it more clearer in terms of the volume of different tweets whether they're positive or negative across different parts of the city or the, the city region okay just um, one final thing then um before well a couple of slides to finish off what i think is really interesting is um like we and i was talking about the text and image relations before what we're trying to do is look at the distance between the text and image so this is a this is a scatter diagram of how close um, you know, the the what's the meaning, you know, the sort of keywords and what's being the meaning of the text compared to the images. So these, you know, so if it's really different, you know, if you might be able to pick on something like, I don't know, one, let me just, sorry, um, let me just pick, say something. Um, so, you know, you can pick on, you know, patient laid down the boogie and played that funky music till he died. Um, so what you've got then is a picture of a surgeon. So this would be quite different mm -hmm. in terms of the text and image relations. So that was just some way of trying to capture that. Okay, just to finish off then, you know, the multimodal distance between them. Okay, let me just, um, I'll share now just back to the slides just to finish off. Um, okay. So that was the sort of visualization dashboard that you know we've we've developed so far. What what we're um, trying to do? Let me just move this around and out the way again. Okay, what we're doing um, on top of that? If I can just um, oops. Oh, sorry. These slides, in case that was a case that didn't work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I had some slides ready to show you in case I couldn't connect to the internet or something went wrong. What we're doing is integrating that with a virtual map um, of. Of Liverpool, um, you know, which um, is there's this little display now. I'll just give you a quick view of it. This map is extraordinary. What we've got is a huge LED wall, it's really high visualization quality. This is the actual visualization. This is the this is the map of Liverpool, but we display it on a huge screen. And this huge screen is VR enabled. What I'd really like to do eventually is be able to map all the data, you know, the so the communications that are geotagged across different parts of the city um, and then use different sorts of immersive analytics to look at the patterns, you know, because it's so complex, as you can see from the brief visualisations that I've done. But this is the virtual map that we've got, which is extraordinary quality. This brings in more context, of course, as well. Um, and you can zoom right in. This is a, you know, map of Liverpool. You can zoom into buildings as well. Okay, so you can overlay with data and you can overlay in areas. So, you know, there's a whole range of different applications in terms of mapping things specifically to the physical context. 
Okay, let's return now to the claim. Shortcomings of AI are linked to the lack of a theory of the phenomena being modeled. And I do think we have robust theories. I do think we can show cultural patterns and I do think we can develop explainable AI approaches where the reasoning and findings are transparent and more understandable by showing what kind of selections give what sort of results you know, and some view into how, you know, the, the, the AI comes up with the results that it does. Um, I think we would need to incorporate the four orders of complexity, the physical, biological, social, and the semiotic systems. Um, and if we had such metasemiotic models, we could develop, I think, explainable AI algorithms that could be interrogated rather than just saying these are the results. We can't see it's a black box. Um, and all that, you know, we've got to show the effects of change of any one system and the physical attributes of the sign itself, colour and size and so forth. Sensory input, is it visual or is it auditory? The social context of when it's made and the semiotic choices across semiotic systems and the results that are obtained. Um, we could challenge the status quo. I mean, really just challenge it because obviously what it does is reinforce existing biases and inequalities. But also it would bring us up to the table, I think, of a step change in research methodologies and tools for understanding uh, the social, cultural, economic and political impact and economic impact of digital media and AI. Um, and it would remove, replace the current, you know, emphasis on data collection surveillance towards, you know, development of useful tools and increased digital and data literacies, which we desperately need. I think academia needs to be reformed. Um, technology depends on vision and visions rooted in social power. We need to convince the public and decision makers of the virtues of different, you know, paths forward of technology development. And academia does play a central role in this. Um, you know, we are the ones that build prospective interests, do research and influence, you know, millions of young people who will work in the technology sector. Um, and often we work with tech firms and directly influence public opinion. So more independent academia. Uh, which is not dependent on corporate funding. As Zuboff said back, you know, now nearly, well, four years ago, uh, five years ago, surveillance capital depends on the social, and it's only through collective social action that we can change it, you know, and that the information age can, you know, be lead towards a flourishing uh, third modernity rather, you know, reclaim the third, a flourishing third modernity. Um, Semiotics, I think, has got a major role to play. And as Ace Mobley has said, the future of technology, future path of technology remains to be written. Thank you so much, and I hope that um, made sense to everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, so I think that's been. Shall I stop sharing? Yeah, shall I stop sharing? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah.